I'll present today is in part uh, work I did as part of my PhD uh, and some related work, and it's with a lot of co-authors because I've, I've taken a lot of bits together, together with Paul Taylor, my DPhil supervisor, uh, Bruce Sutherland at the University of Alberta, and some experimental work here done together with Colin Whitaker and Alison Raby at the University of Plymouth. This is my pedagogical tool, which some of you might have seen and some of you might have been upset by, by but which I tend to bring uh, to, to seminars just to, to, to explain the title uh, to a really wide and diverse audience working on very different problems. Um, so I'm looking at the mean flows that are induced by waves. And the importance of that statement can be illustrated by this duck uh, put on a wave. It's a little bit silly, but it helps to illustrate the point. Uh, and and when, when we put this duck on a wave, say in a bath or, or near the coastline, then everyone's willing to go along with me uh, with the fact that this duck will be moving up and down due to the wave as well as forwards and backwards. Now, I'm not predominantly interested in that motion. I'm interested in any net motion. So the question you might ask yourself if you're stood at the beach, is this duck coming towards you or not? And more generally, if you don't apply it to a duck, but to a neutrally buoyant Lagrangian particle, is this particle being moved by a wave or not? And, and, and that statement can relate to vertical as well as horizontal motion. So in other words, is there any mean motion that results from wave motion, which is in principle periodic? And um, um, I, I, today I'd like to pre present some results on two types of, of gravity waves. So I'm interested in gravity waves. Um, uh, those will be surface waves uh, and internal waves. You can think of surface waves as a sort of simple example where you have two density layers and air is the top, top layer and you can really ignore air for the purposes of your calculation. The old other limit is where you have two fluids superimposed onto one another and those are called interfacial waves. The case in, in the middle is where the density doesn't have a discrete jump but varies continuously. And the terminology I use for those is internal uh, wave groups because they're not associated anymore with a surface. Uh, as such. And I'll focus on the two uh, boxes on the left. And here are some illustrations, surface waves as, as we might have them here in the Sanderson flume uh, just around the corner, um, similar to interfacial waves. And you can think, although internal waves, because they do not have a surface, they're really difficult to visualize, you can think in principle of some limit of an infinite number of layers of, of different density that superimpose onto one another. And here you can see a lab image um, which is kind of to illustrate that limit of a number of layers of different density where the layers are here sort of marked with a trait. The strength of that sort of the density, background density, is typically denoted by a buoyancy frequency n naught, but it gives you a measure of how varied the density is. Now, although surface waves are a clear example which we see when we go to the beach or to a river, uh, internal waves to some uh, are, are less clear. So, so where do they occur? Well, they occur in the oceans where they're the result of uh, salinity and temperature. Uh, so there's an example here of, of, a, of a distribution of uh, the, the temperature and, and I think the effective uh, salinity here with depth. And the idea being that in certain regions, you might approximate a linear, uh, see a linear variation. But in, a, at any point here, any variation is a medium that can in principle support waves. And similarly in the atmosphere, if you look over here, you can see um, uh, the, there's some uh, length scales here, 85 kilometers. That, that show you the temperature, hence effectively the, the density varies. So also, although you don't see these waves, there are lots of waves that behave like surface gravity waves, but not equivalently, that go on in the atmosphere that might be generated by storms and might be traveling in related but not completely uh, equivalent ways to the surface waves we might know and study in this institute. So what I'll talk about today, I'll, I'll start uh, by talking about surface gravity waves, uh, talking about periodic waves, something called Stokes Drift, which is uh, pro probably taught in most of the undergraduate engineering courses, fluids courses. Then I'll look at what happens when I start from a periodic or a regular wave and go into an irregular wave or a wave group, as the physics is modified. And then I'll move on to internal uh, wave groups. And hopefully I'll sort of illustrate the basic points uh, about uh, uh, surface uh, gravity waves first then I can use those concepts later. And I'll end up hoping to place this in a sort of a context, why might we research this and what are the open questions in the literature. So if we look at a, a surface gravity wave, um, then, um, well, this is the, the picture we see in, in, in the mathematics, although uh, for the purpose of this talk, you don't need to follow all the analysis. The main idea is there's a, a linear governing equation, which is Laplace, if we assume uh, incompressible and irrotational flow, and all the nonlinearity of the problem, so all the real physics of the problem is added at the free surface. 
So there's a kinematic free surface boundary condition and a dynamic free surface boundary condition, essentially saying a particle that sits at the surface stays at the surface and the uh, free surface is a streamlined pressure is constant. And there's always a bottom boundary condition. So that, in a fundamental sense, <coughs> in, in the simplest possible way, is the surface gravity wave problem. If you generate periodic waves, for example, in the lab, like the illustration that James showed before we had the perturbation, then and if you track the orbits underneath uh, and the Lagrangian orbits, so by putting in some dye, then these orbits that are traced out are circles in the deep water limit. But if you look very, very closely, then it turns out these circles are not quite closed. And the fact that these circles don't close, that is Stokes drift, after Stokes, who first described this. So. Th I mean, it's a little bit hard to observe in the lab because this is a nonlinear effect, but you can see there's a small movement as the particle goes through its circular and periodic motion, uh, and it actually ends up a bit towards the right. And this is our duck moving, but in a Lagrangian particle uh, sense. And this is a, a picture actually taken from Van Dyck's album of fluid motion. So in that sense, it's sort of a classical uh, problem. Now, can we describe that uh, using some simple linear theory? Yes. If we take, a, for example, a horizontal velocity uh, locally and we perturb it by doing a delta x perturbation and a delta z perturbation, this is here for a particle at the surface, then we can, after some averaging out, some averaging out procedure, we can see that there's a net u Stokes drift, there's a net mean flow that is uh, proportional to the celerity of the wave and alpha squared, where alpha is the, is the small parameter of our system is the steepness of the wave. So th there we can see that from a linearized wave theory where you would only concern al consider alpha terms, so small terms, then you can get a smaller alpha squared Stokes drift term that results. Now that is a, uh, that's a, a sort of a Lagrangian velocity if you like. You can also take the velocity field, the linear velocity field, and integrate from the bottom to the free surface and you'll see there's a, there's a, there's a mean term from the same averaging procedure that results. So uh, in other sense, if you set up this problem, there's actually a mean flow uh, that takes place in the tank. Now what happens if we replace a periodic wave by a wave group? So we replace a purely periodic wave by a wave packet. So this would be the, the free surface. Then what turns out uh, to happen is that the Stokes drift, so this transport which we saw in the illustration that is in the direction to the right, has to have, if we look at the proper conservation equations, has to have a flow in the opposite direction known as the return flow. The, together, these, these make for a, a, a balanced flow system. And what I'd like to show here is just some lab measurements taken, uh, uh, made in Plymouth um, of some particle tracking velocimetry. So this is uh, uh, essentially a, a light sheet with, uh, with, with uh, high uh, quality cameras that allows us to track some of these particles. And I'm going to show you some of these results for a particle at the surface, so something that's dominated by Stokes drift, and a particle at depth. And so this is x and this is z, and the actual dimensions don't really matter uh, for this illustration. But I'm just going to turn on the time marching of these, I should add, uh, experimental results. And there are a few different orbits that are within view of our camera. So we see as time goes on, the time tr uh, stamp is the same. So we see really quick and fast motion that is now f formed by these uh, close to circular orbits, but quite a few of them because of the individual waves that make up the packet and the actual particle starts on the left, say here, and moves to the right. On a slightly sh uh, slower time scale, and I'm wondering whether I've actually turned on the video, I think I have, on a much slower time scale, we see a different motion. So what's in blue is the ultimate motion, and what's in um, yellow is, is the actual motion as the timestamp progresses. Now I wonder whether this video is actually on. Now it is. And you see that the particle starting on the right, one, one thing you observe is the motions are much smaller. I don't think this is compiled across platform, but I can fast forward. And you see if I fast forward that the actual motion is horseshoe shaped and it's in the opposite direction. So this is really the dynamics of the return flow here at depth that is dominant. Um, and these are important because if we do momentum and, and, and mass balances, we need to take both these effects into account. And it's important because if we ask ourselves where do particles go, clearly particles near the surface move in one direction, but particles at depth will move in the opposite direction. So this is an illustration of the actual measured trajectories of a particle near the surface. We need to do a little bit of post-processing. So if we look just at the pictures on the right, you see the actual orbits that are being traced out, some experimental results. And when we filter out any mean flow, any long time signals that might be present in an experimental tank, we can predict the net displacement from the blue initial point to the red point. And similarly, for a particle at depth, this with this horseshoe shaped trajectory, it now starts uh, at the position on the right and it goes through these orbits 
that look like a horseshoe if you, if you filter out the wave type signal, it moves to the left. If we do this for a number of different particles, uh, as a depth distribution, we can plot the net horizontal displacement as a function of depth. And here we see the actual experimental results um, from that uh, result here. And then what we're plotting here is really the Lagrangian displacement. So it's the sum of any Stokes drift in the terminology of this problem and any mean flows. So the mean flow that we really have, Eulerian mean flow, is this return flow that takes part, part underneath. Uh, Overlain in red is a theoretical expression which I'm going to give here, but there's, there's no point uh, I haven't introduced the symbols, but what, what one can do is using a separation of scales expansion, one can develop a closed form expression in some cer certain limits for this net displacement out of those reasonably complicated nonlinear boundary conditions. And that just shows that there is a net displacement which gives us a depth variation that goes as a cosh plus some uh, effective other terms that just depend on K0D, the effective water depth of the problem, where K0 is the wave number of the problem and, and D is the depth of the tank. So that gives us a measure, a typical measure of whether this is a, a shallow water tank or a deep water tank. So we get really, really good overlap with experimental results. So just summing up, this really is the picture for surface gravity wave groups. We've got two types of flow. There's a Stokes drift or Stokes transport that happens, uh, that's a Lagrangian effect if you like, that happens near the surface and is located, sort of, uh, is really sort of concentrated near the surface and we have a Eulerian return flow that has to balance this because of mass conservation arguments and um, that happens at depth. You can think in some sense of this return flow as the flow that is needed to balance this. If we think of these arrows denoting the magnitude of the Stokes transport because the Stokes transport is a local function of the local amplitude it will be much bigger at the center where the amplitude is big, alpha squared if you like, and much smaller here locally uh, where, where the w local wave amplitude is small. Then you see that, of course, the flux that's associated with this will vary with the envelope. So in other words, there's much more fluid being transported here than there is there and there. So there's excess and a deficit of fluid. So what, from going to the big arrow to the small arrow, you have an excess of fluid. So that fluid, in a sense, is being dumped back into the mean flow and has to go back to, to form this deficit here as it goes from the small arrow to the big arrow. So you can solve this entire return flow problem as a mass conservation. Uh, argument and some of these results, uh, although described in a not in a in a slightly different mathematical framework, have been known for for quite a long time, although often forgotten uh, in the literature. That as soon as you as you perturb your uh, periodic wave and you replace it by a, a wave group, then you have to take into account a different Eulerian flow at the same order, the second order of the problem. Um, <coughs> now, so that that's the surface gravity waves, uh, and now I. So having introduced that, I'd like to move on to uh, internal uh, gravity wave groups. Um, so as I say, the motivation is, is either oceans or atmospheres. The, the equations are very, very similar. Uh, and here I see, I just repeat my illustration. As a function of depth, I see here the temperature and, and the, uh, the salinity. So, in the, at so it's the, in the oceans, it's the salinity and the temperature. In the atmosphere, is the temperature and pressure that you need to take into account. And just taking a step back, whereas if we looked at the surface gravity wave problem, we had a linear governing equation, Laplace, so that was trivial. All the difficulty came from the boundary conditions. Now, this problem is different because there, are, there is no surface, so effectively there are no boundary conditions unless you impose them. But you can consider uh, a background stratification and solve the problem just locally, so it's not driven by a free surface. So all the nonlinearity comes in through the actual governing equations. So if we think of the density uh, of a problem as the, uh, so rho as rho z, the background density plus a density perturbation. So, so that's kind of the framework. So then we can write everything in terms of the denti density perturbation. And we can write the momentum equations. And these are the Boussinesq momentum equations. So we only care about density perturbations where they give rise to a buoyancy force. We don't consider them in all the other uh, terms, so in the advective and all the other terms in the momentum equation, which is a really standard assumption in this literature. The dominant effect of density perturbations is not to change the momentum advective uh, or convective terms in the momentum equation. It's just to generate a buoyancy force. And then we have conversion, essentially conservation of mass, which you can think of if you want to generalize this um, uh, to a sort of slightly more general thermodynamic setting as, as conservation of internal energy, which gives you a statement like that, which just says that the density that is contained as a total derivative will be uh, associated with any uh, background density variations, which might be linear, 
um, as they are fluxed in by, by the uh, vertical velocity. And we still assume, to, to make some headway, this is an incompressible problem. So you, you, you're fine by assuming that. So you no longer get Laplace because of, uh, because of, the, um, um, because of this density no longer being constant. So you get generation of vorticity effectively. Now, taking a step back, how does we know how a surface wave evolves. Uh, we know typically in deep water the group velocity uh, could be half of the phase velocity, so it just stays at the surface and it moves at a certain speed. However, internal waves move, they behave fundamentally differently. So here I've got a picture of an internal wave group, harder to illustrate, so I'm just illustrating as a Gaussian packet. So this is the location of the packet, and the question I'm asking myself, where does it go? So this is an illustration of this packet. So this is the local change in the equidensity potentials. So it has a um, it has a, a, a group structure. So it just says there's a, a group component in the x direction, group component in the z direction, and the sigma characteristic scale of the packet. So this gives us a packet, and there are some fast dynamics associated with the waves. So this, for electrical engineers, might be a standard representation of sort of a, a fast uh, carrier wave and a sort of a, an envelope to, to modulate that. <coughs> And what you get if you solve the actual problem, you get a dispersion equation, so an equation that relates um, a frequencies to wave numbers that looks like this. So it's not dispersive in the classical sense, but it does mean that um, the group velocity and the phase velocity are orthogonal to one another, which makes for an uh, interesting problem. So when the actual wave energy goes in this direction, the individual waves go in the opposite direction. Whereas in the surface wave problem, although they, the group velocity and the wave velocity weren't necessarily a, a, a uh, equal to one another, they did move in the same direction. And that sort of changes the dynamic. So what I'm interested in is, is there a Stokes drift, like, uh, like before, or is there an induced mean flow um, um, associated with such a packet? So such a packet travels, and, and what are the mean flows? What are the net displacements, possibly? So I assume a uniformly stratified ambient, so I'm looking locally at a piece of the background stratification which varies uh, linearly. I'm making this Boussinesque approximation, I'm not just interested in an effect of dissipation, so it's a non-dissipative system, there's no viscosity. I'm not really interested in non-linearity uh, above second order, so no non-linear evolution that's very complicated, also no feedback which you could have as the mean flow is uh, seen by the packet as it evolves. That is all sort of outside of my range of interest, and I'm just going to look at two-dimensional setups and three-dimensional setups. Previously, I just looked at two-dimensional representations, as that didn't really matter. In our case now, the, the number of dimensions that you give to the problem is going to make a fundamental difference. How do I approach this problem? So essentially taking a step back, this is the mathematical problem, so there are just two, uh, two equations, essentially two nonlinear equations as well as two unknowns, so you can write it in different, but essentially you have to have a tracker density and tracker velocity field. How do I do this? Do I put this in a computer? No, what we do instead is we use uh, some mathematical techniques known as uh, uh, separation of scales as well as perturbation expansions. So in the surface wave literature as well as many other literatures, you typically simplify the problem by assuming the waves are small. So you can assume everything takes place at the free surface. Um, and, and, and in other words, if you see any parameters that behave like alpha, so it's the steepness of the wave, uh, then you just look at the leading order terms in that. You can think of another small parameter uh, that I call epsilon. That is really, if we look at this setup, it's the ratio of the length scale of the, s of the actual waves that make up the packet, as well as the, the packet scale. So these give, this gives us two uh, scales. And if we take the ratio of them, we can assume there are many waves in a packet, and we can look, in other words, at the separation of scales type of argument. So if we look at only small effects in epsilon, we're only considering cases where there are many waves that make up the packet. So we can really simplify the problem. And this, this is sort of a WKB approximation, which is a more general approximation used in the mathematics literature, but one you would often also see in sort of signal processing applications. The results that I obtained from that I compare to some fully nonlinear uh, numerical simulations. Um, and some videos to illustrate that point. So my main point here is that in, in many problems you can make headway by assuming some, there's a dim dimension that does not matter. In this particular problem we thought the same, but it turns out there's a crucial difference between 2D and 3D. And I'll explain, uh, if there's anything you'd like to take away from this, I'll try and explain why that might be. Um, so rather than go into the detail of the solutions, I'm just going to show you the solution and, and forget about the text for a 3D setup. So we've got a fully 3D setup, so the wave packet evolves with a group velocity and a phase velocity, and it has uh, both a plane and into the plane degree of freedom. 
what the what the stratification now does, because this is a stratified medium, um, it actually reduces all the dynamics to sheets. So because of the stratification inhibits motion, you can simplify the problem if you do the perturbation analysis to all the mean flows taking place in local horizontal sheets. And if we take one such sheet here, I'm filtering out all the linear wave motion. I'm just looking at the induced mean flow velocity field. So this is x, this is y, so it's the z is, is into the plane, which is the direction in which we have stratification. And it's scaled on the packet scale. So if we had a Gaussian packet, the dynamics would be sort of between uh, sort of uh, minus two and two, if you like, in both directions. And what we see if we look at the velocity vectors is that there is a, through the center of the packet, there's a flow in this direction. And around it, there seems to be a flow transporting stuff backwards, which is very much reminiscent of the earlier problem. So what we see when we previously saw Stokes drift near the surface, and below it, we had this return flow. And it's exactly the same equation you obtain. You obtain, uh, we don't call it the Stokes drift because it technically isn't, but there's a uh, sort of wave induced mean flow through the center. And to balance the argument, you have to have a return flow around it. So if you like, the 2D uh, internal, the 3D, I should say this very carefully, 3D internal wave problem is very, very uh, comparable to if we are willing to make this uh, map to just a plane to the surface wave problem. And from a fundamental physics perspective, at leading order, and perhaps at all subsequent orders, stratification just takes out the fizz uh, because it just allows you not to have anything in the direction of that stratification. So this is all the mean flow dynamics. There's a return flow, which is these large loops, and there's what we call a divergent flux induced mean flow, which is a very complicated and not very helpful term, but it's akin to that Stokes transport you saw in some hand wavy sense in the surface gravity wave problem. Now, I'm not going to want to explain any of the details. We're just going to sort of explain the mechanics of a type of calculation. As the mechanics of this type of calculation might come back into different sort of a PhD student type of problems. And the, the, what, we, what we did here is we simplified, we simplified the whole uh, nonlinear dynamics problem into this equation. And, and the, the point is not to, to understand the full equation. The point is just to see what its structure is. So the flow field, uh, for the, this is now for the 2D problem, which is fundamentally different. So the flow field uh, 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 described by Psi, a uh, 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 velocity potential, um, no stream function, has a number of differential operators operating on it and has a number of nonlinear driving terms on the right hand side. So there are some interactions between a velocity field, a vorticity field, and a velocity field and a perturbation field. The point is not to understand all these terms. The point is to see the, the, the actual structure of the problem. And what we did is, similarly as before, we, we did a, a, a sort of a looked at what are the important terms. So one looks at what are the terms in the steepness and amplitude that you could consider, and what are the terms in the bandwidth, the other small parameter, epsilon. So if we, if we t take all these terms, we can put orders on things. Effectively, all the differential uh, operators um, they operate on, they take out one of these scales because any variation is to do with that packet variation. So they take out two scales. So here we have uh, at least four, so we have four. And here we can order, there's always a nonlinear interaction, so there are alpha squared terms. And if we actually do the counting correctly, we see that this is the problem. So if we reduce the leading order physics to the simplest of problems, the simplest of cases, the lowest order effect, it turns out that that gives us the fact that you cannot have any mean flow against the stratification, sort of the physics we expect if you do that analysis. So there can't be any mean flow against the stratification, which is really simple. But that also means to balance, uh, to balance mass that you can't have any variation of the horizontal velocity, because of course that in 2D that has to be compensated by such. And although it seems trivial, that left us with, with sort of a, 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 a problem. So these are now... Um, and these are now some of the um, um, numerical calculations. And this is, we filter out all the linear dynamics. We just look at, on the color scale, is the horizontal velocity for the u, that's the x direction, and w, that's the stratification, the z direction. We see there's nothing here. This is zero. This is the color scale, is the scaled velocity. So that's correct. And what we saw, we saw these disturbances, which were um, really long. So we, indeed, we weren't allowed to see any variation, and that's what we saw. So we saw these mean flows that seemed long relative to the scale of the packet. So the scale of the packet, so 2 sigma, on this scale is about 40 of the local units. So you can think of, sort of this being the, uh, the scale of, of where the packet actually sits. So it generates these long uh, 
And then we made a numerical domain enormous, so really, really made this enormously big at, at huge cost, and we saw this is the actual uh, solution to the problem. So as this packet here sits here and it, 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 it travels at, at these right angles between the group and the phase velocity, but because of the scales it might just look like it's traveling up, you see it generates these mean flows that look like ship waves. And indeed the mathematics of which are those of ship waves. Um, can we explain that? Well, uh, and this is more of a, if, if there's anything you'd like to take away from this, is sort of the art of perturbation expansions, as you might apply them to different problems. You have to define your fast scales and your slow scales. So here we said all the slow evolution takes place, it travels with the group velocity, and there's one single parameter, epsilon, that sits in between. Now, it's an art, so you can change that and say, well, actually, these are long responses. So you should really think of enormously long scale, which is two orders of magnitude away. <coughs> And then we do a similar result uh, type of analysis, and I'm not going to talk about any of the detail, but you can make a number of mathematical approximations, and actually, and again, I don't want to, you to, exp I don't want to explain the full form of the equations, but we can then, by using a number of tricks, get a closed form solution for the mean flow field. And that's this solution here. So this is a horizontal velocity field, this is the actual stream function with the packet here located at the center. So this seems to be coming out if we allow ourselves to make these assumptions about the structure, if we make these assumptions about the structure of the problem. Uh, and now some, some illustrations of what an actual problem looks like. I think this is sort of where some understanding might come back after I've taken you through some uh, perhaps complicated uh, analysis. Uh, this is now an illustration of the horizontal uh, velocity field, just all the linear fields. So this you can think of as a wave packet as it evolves in space. So I'm going to turn on that video and it's going to show us that the individual waves travel in this direction, whereas the energy travels in this direction. That's the group uh, internal wave dynamics. If I look at the picture here on the right, I'm going to filter out all the linear stuff and hopefully see the nonlinearity that's left in our problem. So those are the mean flows that I'm interested in. And we're going to, for the purposes of this, uh, just ignore the uh, bar on the right, because that matches the theory with the predictions. But I just want to illustrate the point. So we see, as I turn on time, which it doesn't like, Turn on time, I see that I s if I look carefully, the waves go in this direction and the wave packet goes in this direction. The resolution is, is not extremely good, but you can see if we filter out all that, what's left, and it's quite a small number at the horizontal velocity color scale, we see these mean flows. And these are sort of uh, numerical simulations of the same governing equation. So these are the mean flows uh, that develop. Um, and here is a match just to compare um, to compare metrics. We can predict in terms of some complicated, but they're all in, in some uh, mathematical package or they're written down somewhere, some close for mathematical structure for the, um, the actual solution here in the dashed line and the black line. This is the horizontal velocity at x and y, just to do a prediction. And we can see across different time steps because we don't initialize the problem correctly, because we don't really know the initial conditions. We just compare and hope it converges to the steady state of the problem, that indeed we get a really good match between the theory and the numerical predictions. So um, just to sort of sum up, um, where do induced mean flows in generally come from? Well, they generally come from the advective terms in the momentum equation, sometimes known as the sort of, uh, uh, and so these are the, um, um, the, the du, u, dx type of terms. That's the origin of mean flows in any type of gravity wave problem, as well as plasma type problems. So that's typically where things come, that's where the linearity comes from. And this is known as Stokes transport for surface gravity waves, so that has a name and that's something that's been measured and is relevant uh, uh, across many applications. And it's the packet structure, so the fact that you modulate individual waves that makes this mean flow divergent. And that divergence somehow needs to be compensated for and that is done by something we call the return flow. So it's just solving, it becomes a solving potential flow exercise. And an also physically important part is that if you look at the 2D problem, the response is now an order of magnitude longer than we expect. So based on theory, you might expect, the simplest of theory, you might expect mean flows to evolve on the scale of the packet. Whereas in reality, it's one order bigger than that. So if you are generating a, a mean flow disturbance, you should expect to see it much further ahead than you might otherwise. So just to sum up in a pictorial sense, if we like, we can sort of think of balanced mean flows and unbalanced mean flows. Balanced mean flows are the surface gravity wave problem where you have a nice match 
between the stoke transport and the return flow. Everything's steady in the frame that moves with the weight packet, and uh, it's a very simple problem. Similarly to the 3D problem, where if we're willing to go into the plane, then it's also a similar type of steady problem. If we look at the internal 2D internal wave group, in a sense, we've taken one, two, too many uh, degrees of freedom from, from physics, and that's, it's been punishing it's punishing us for that by not generating a balanced mean flow but shedding these long waves to compensate for the fact that it can't because it doesn't have the additional degree of freedom to go around because it's 2D and stratification inhibits any mean flows in the, in the vertical and this is the only type of response if you like in the terms of physical argument type of way it can, uh, it can expect. Now why is this all relevant? I mean these are interesting calculations, why might we do it? The big question that I have in the back of my mind, al although I'm not sure if this directly answers it, is the, the question that's often asked, do waves mix the ocean? Should we think of this mixing as a, an important process? And there's a, a lot of recent, a recent work on trying to take these big numerical models that are used for climate predictions or weather predictions, uh, especially of the oceanic part, and, and because they don't resolve individual waves, one has to put in mean flows themselves. So you have to parameterize stoke shift and mean flows. Now, the current parameterizations are all based on periodic waves. And there's a current, there are some uh, results uh, here in the sort of geophysical literature that attempt to improve the parameterizations to, fact, uh, to include the fact that this is a, a wave packet rather than a periodic wave. And that's, I think, a really relevant problem. And that, from that perspective, I have some results that you should also care about some of the other th things like the actual depth of the problem and the directional spreading make a fundamental uh, difference. But the ultimate question is here, do waves lead to pollutant dispersion? And that's not displacing pollutant, but actually dispersing it in a Taylor dispersion sense. So does it make the distribution larger or not? And that, I think, is to a large extent an unanswered question that's beginning to be answered um, for shallow water waves, but hasn't been answered for general water depths. A second uh, question, then I'll wrap up, is, is uh, a lateral mixing by internal interfacial waves. Um, so there are some experiments that show there's a lot of lateral mixing, so mixing along the equidensity surfaces by internal waves. And um, because these waves, uh, so this is a picture here of, of an actual wave uh, here at a specific location, they can be quite big, although we don't see them, we don't see them, but they can be 10, 20, sometimes 30 meters, but they're all below the surface. These can have mean flows associated with them, and the question is, are they important for mixing? There are some sort of, uh, if you like, um, uh, unexplained uh, observations in the literature uh, uh, that, that, that suggest this mixing could potentially be, be larger. And I, I hasten to add that internal waves, they've only be become popular in the last 30 or so literature uh, years, largely by pictures such as this. So, so although all the dynamics is below the surface, there's typically a small disturbance of the free surface. So you can get these beautiful satellite pictures here of the Strait of Gibraltar where you see these uh, surface disturbances that can be quite small, that might be the counterpart of a lot of dynamics uh, under the ocean. Because we can't really look uh, into the ocean because uh, unlike, w well, one, people say that we know much more about space than we know about the ocean because of the fact that we can't typically see this. So this would be results of an, exp an expensive experimental campaign. So this remains an open question. And, um, that brings us to some uh, future work is, is the idea of looking at um, self-interaction of any waves with the mean flows, which relates a little bit to uh, uh, James's uh, uh, pro pro project, is to look at how, if waves might actually meet their own mean flow, how might they be affected by it? So, so you can see how they could be affected by another current that comes in from, uh, say, uh, a certain location, a lake or anything, but they could also be affected by self-interaction. And that's a, one of the open questions I'm trying to address. And at that point, I'm probably going to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.